another episode of So I've Been Told. This week, I'm talking to my buddy, Paul James Bourgeois. Didn't get an episode out last week, got really busy, but I'm coming back strong with this episode. We're going to have another mini episode coming out later this week, so we will be back to normal. So thanks for being patient. I really hope you enjoy my conversation I have with Paul, and I'll talk to you after the interview. Later. All right, we're rolling. Cool. So, my first hard-hitting question is, how the hell do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> it's Bourgeois. Bourgeois, okay. Bourgeois. Just because when I introduce you, I want to make sure I say your name right. right. So, Paul and I have known each other for a couple years. I don't, I don't really remember where we first met. Do you? Um, I think through Nick Gelbo, Meat Grinder. Who you just, Probably. Nick, who you just interviewed as well. Yeah. Now it'll be two episodes ago, because oh. I just put out a new episode today. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we met at the Meat Grinder, and so that, I, I, there's like a series of first questions that I generally ask, and I always ask where I met the person. Yeah. Well, not always, but a lot of times, and then I ask how you got into, like, punk and hardcore music, and or indie music in general, punk in a broad sense. I, uh, hard to think about, um... Had to have been at least 10, almost 11 years ago, back when the Penny was still open. I think the first show I ended up going to, I was just a 14, 15 year old kid. And a friend of mine who's now married, Sarah, was interested in some guy that was playing in a band at the Penny. And we ended up going out there and... The funniest part about it is I told my mom I was going out to a show and her and her boyfriend thought I was talking about going to the movies because I said (laughs) I'm going out to a show and they were not pleased when I rolled in 15 years old, rolled into the house at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning when I left at 8. So I think the first shows, I bands I saw, I don't know if you remember, Sarek or Mainline Adrenaline. Were they local Rochester bands? Local, way back. That's way before my time here, so <laughs> I have no idea who they are. God, I haven't even thought about the band Mainline Adrenaline in years. Very cool. So, what what genre were those bands in? Kind of the, not hardcore, by my definition, hardcore, everybody's got their own different definition, it's construed different ways. Kind of the uh, metal post-hardcore Okay. Yeah. Do you know what what year that would have been, or or around what year? Oh, God. I was 15. Almost 2005, 2006. Okay. I had to have been in ninth grade. That makes sense. There was a lot of of metalcore going around at that. 2005, 2006? Yeah, because because of all the uh, re-releases and reunion tours going on right now. Well, Under, Under Oath was, like, huge. Like, that's... Yeah, 2006 was, um... That era. What was the CD... Well, 04, the one with the the girl with the breathing mask on. That was 04 when their only chasing safety came out. So it was you know right that that same era. I remember I had a mix CD of back in 2006 2007. Everybody asked like what bands I was into back then, and they always assume it's going to be like that Under Oath, Seos, and Senses Fail, which I love those bands. But I think my favorite mix CD that I'd made. On Windows Media Player, burning a CD <laughs> through iTunes or Windows Media Player, whatever it was. Um, what was on it? I Killed the Prom Queen, One mm. Dead, Three Wounded, Bleeding Through. Bleeding Through was a big one for me. Okay. God, what else was on that? On the Last Day. Okay, I don't know them. One Dead, Three Wounded, that's from their band from Pennsylvania, am I? Yes. What's up? That broke up. Yeah. <laughs> God, that band broke up like, oh... Eight or nine? Something like say. that. They were they were one of those bands that I didn't really... I don't think I ever saw them, but I would always see older hardcore dudes at shows in Pennsylvania wearing their shirts.
You want to know what else, what you'll actually laugh at? Speaking of 2004, 2005, 2006 stuff, I found an unopened copy of a Trust Kill Takeover compilation at the Goodwill in Greece, along with like a dozen unopened copies of all three Roses Are Red albums. Weird. And that, <laughs> that band has members that are from, from it's, here, too. It was a Rochester band. Okay. Roses cool. Are Red. Yeah, because I, I definitely have a Roses Are Red CD. I don't remember which one. I have a bunch of shirts and stuff like that. I still talk to Vince all the time. Cool. They used to play drums. But all the bands that were on that Trust Kill Takeover compilation, that's more of what I listened to. I'm assuming Got, 18 Visions was on there. 18 Visions, Open Hand, Throwdown, Most Precious Blood, First Blood. Mm. God, what else? Bad Light for Blue Eyes was a big one that I really enjoyed. And another person I still talk to is Danny, who ended up being the vocalist for that. Is that our Bad Light for Blue Eyes from? from no, here? they Jersey, but they played Rochester a lot with with Roses Are Red. Okay, because they were both Trust Kill and they were both the same yeah. genre. God, what else? Crash Romeo, do you remember them? I do, and that band is a Rochester band. No. Are you sure? I'm positive Crash Romeo wasn't a Rochester band. I I don't know, man. I, I, I'm Wikipediaing this right now as we speak. Cause I'm, I'm trying to think of <laughs> what else was on that Trust Kill Takeover compilation. Walls of Jericho, because they were originally oh, yeah. Trust Kill. Cool. Who they? They're one of those bands that just announced their reunion and that they're playing shows again. And that they're dropping a new album. <laughs> That's, it's, it's such a weird time because, I mean, 2005 was when I graduated from high school. So there are so many of these bands that were a big deal back then that are coming Doing back. it all again right now. Yeah. 2005, 2006 was like that prime time for me when I really started getting into music. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, of course, was your typical kid before I really got into music myself that listened to all that stuff that was on the radio and whatever my parents listened to. I was big on Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi was my favorite band before I started getting into <laughs> actual music on my own and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, you were right about Crash Romeo. Not from here. Not from here. They're from New Jersey. I Another... They're, I heard that there was some kind of a connection to here, though, other than just them playing here a lot. Mm-hmm. So if anybody listening knows, hit me up and, and <laughs> let me know, because I, I want to know where that idea got planted into my head. Well, Crash Romeo, Bud Light for Blue Eyes, Roses Are Red. What other stuff was around then? There's another one that I'm thinking of. Blessed by a Broken Heart. Okay. That whole uh, kind of pop. That You know what I'm talking about, that, like... Pop, it was almost to a point of, like, pop boy band, but not yeah, of, that that was, er, of that era. That was where we were, that was, like, the beginnings of... The Sunstreak was one that was from here. Yeah. That was in that same blend of music. That was where we were getting to the point where I was kind of stepping out. Like, where I was just like, I'm not really with, with this whole, like, weird fashion <laughs> pop metal. Because that's what it was, is, like, almost... Not fashion pop metal, but how do I exp- It wasn't... It was like a pop indie phase of music. What other bands fell into that, too? I can't think off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't remember. I, I, I've tried to block a lot. <laughs> but I mean, I think that's that's why we have bands like Asking Alexandria and that, stuff like that still around now. I'm not... They're coming up. They're playing here soon. I, I think I saw March that. March 4th? Maybe. They're playing with While She Sleeps, who I do love While She Sleeps, but I'm not a fan of asking. Yeah, and uh, what's what's another band? Another Pennsylvania band. Barrier Dead's back and doing shows for now. That's weird. But they weren't Pennsylvania. They were Massachusetts. Yeah, Yeah, no, there's there's a Pennsylvania band that I can't think of that's, you know, like a kind of pop screamo band. They're from Wilkes-Barre. Jay Resnick. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, God. Uh, motionless and White. Are they Pennsylvania? Yeah. They're not really pop. They're like that like Hot Topic metalcore. So I was asking Alexandria. They're like that mix of like pop electronic 
what I like to call hot topic core. Yeah, as I a mean, joke, it, almost. That 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 makes sense. They look Jay, like Jay Resnick. Is he the one who Jay Resnick? Like, he does the Loaded Words podcast, and is he the one who's married to that incredible tattoo artist? No, Jay Resnick isn't a member of that band. Jay's just a friend of mine. Oh, who um, does another podcast. He's on one of the guys from Motionless and White. His fiance or wife or something is it? Freaking phenomenal tattoo artist mm. that won't do tattoos unless you like know someone that she knows because she's so sought after in tattoo work. Yeah, someone was showing me her work last night, and that's all I can think of now when people say motionless and white. <laughs> well, one side story before we move on from this is right around the time when Bed Light for Blue Eyes was a thing, I was in a band called Red Eyes for Blue Skies. <laughs> and, which is That's a terrible band name. And we also, we came up with that band name before we knew that was a thing. And I think we almost played with them at one point, which would have been real weird. But yeah. I thought, just was just thinking about it, you were asking how I got into music and what and whatnot. Aside from like, that was my first, my friend being interested in this guy in a band was my first exposure to it. After that, I started falling into a lot of bands because I, uh, I ended up working, not working, but doing the whole school radio thing mm-hmm. for Wester Andaquite for a little while, which okay. was WIRQ, and ended up finding a lot of things that way. That's how I really got into Bed Light. What other CDs did we play in there? From First to Last. Mm-hmm. There was a From First to Last CD in there. There's a Hawthorne Heights CD in there that we'd play all the time. Coming to Rochester soon. Yeah, also <laughs> with Mest and... Uh, the Ataris, who are the only band on that bill that I care about. But <laughs> So I don't know if I'll go or not. I, I never got into Mest. I couldn't tell you a single Mest song. Hawth- Hawthorne Heights, on the other hand, wasn't huge into them. The only, the only exposure I had to that band was playing them at the school radio station. And they were that... Mm. They were that big emo screamo band of like two thousand five, two thousand six. Yeah, I remember summer of oh five, like seeing them on MTV two, seeing that on MTV two, and also the Andy Milanakis show. That that's what I remember from that summer. The first, I'm thinking about more f- like first music stuff. I remember the first CD is that I went because I lived right by the House of Guitars. I grew up right on Seneca and Seneca and Titus. Again, Nick, me and Nick lived a street over from each other. We've cool. been good, good friends for years. He was on Thorndike, I was on Seville Drive. I remember the first CDs I bought, I walked up to the House of Guitars and bought a Newfound Glory, Newfound Glory's Catalyst. Nice. The Foo Fighters' Best of You CD, because that song, Best of You, was playing on MTV2 nonstop every, like, five songs or something. And that song, in my opinion, still holds up and is one of the best songs that they've ever written. Oh, yeah. It's so good. <laughs> that song, do you remember, though, when you, could, you couldn't turn on the radio or MTV without seeing that music video or hearing that song? I do, and I remember that that music video is super badass. Yeah, because that song was like six minutes long, and you couldn't escape that song for the longest time. And there were just like animals attacking each other and shit in the music video. It yeah. Was, it was real intense. Oh, it, it was like, it was half of seeing David Grohl's mouth singing into a microphone, and half seeing animals attack each other National Geographic style. Yeah. That was the entire music video from what I recall. Yeah, it's it's real cool to hate on the Foo Fighters right now, but that song still kicks ass. Why is anybody hating on the Foo Fighters? I don't know. I don't think everything they've done is. I don't know. He's had a Dave Grohl's had a long career, and so not everything he's done has been amazing. But he definitely has written. <laughs> he's definitely written some killer songs. The third CD that I picked up on that same day, the first three CDs I bought. I feel real unfortunate about the third one, considering what ended up happening with that band and the vocalist. Can you take a stab at it? We're talking about MTV. Kind of one hit wonders. What was on, like, on repeat in 2005, 2006? I don't remember. Lost Profits. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with yeah. The, the, the whole stuff about their vocalist. What was that, a couple years back now? Yes. Yeah, he got thrown in prison for 
a mess, a slew of real gross things. Yeah, he he took the last train to prison. <laughs> I was making that joke when he got arrested. Yeah. Well, so have you played in bands at all? I know um, that we, we recently tried to start something and it just kind of didn't work out. But have you had you played in bands before that? I never did anything too seriously. There was the uh, there was one project I did that was kind of a joke. Not really a joke. It was serious, but it was one of those things that when you're like 16, 17, 18 and you're like doing music stuff and you think you're cool, but then you look back at it 6, 7, 8 years later and you're like, god, what was I doing back then? <laughs> I did it do vocals for only a brief stint because there were me it was me and the second vocalist in a band called Finish the Job and I'm not proud of it at all. Did you record anything? There's something out there, yeah. Okay, so I, I could do some digging on the internet. I don't know if you could find it. I'd I'm be gonna, surprised. I'm gonna do some digging. <laughs> there is every once in a great while, maybe once every couple years, I have someone come up to me and be like Remember when you did this and like show me a finish the job CD and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was that. I've done a lot more work, especially recently. As you know, I think you know, I went out in November with the guys from I Set My Friends on Fire just doing merch and guitar teching. God, I think it was a 12, 13 day stint. Nice. I may do that again coming up actually. But on the other side of the coast, it okay. depends on what's going on with my schedule stuff. I'm moving to Buffalo tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I was with Nate last night looking at the itinerary for the announced tour, which is the second leg of the tour that we did in November. Same bands, same exact tour. Okay. The part two of the tour, the Baby Porcupine tour. <laughs> Matt likes to name the tour is very... Funny things. This goes through through Texas, New Mexico, California. Some really cool venues that I've always wanted to see. Um, there's a date at the Whiskey. Oh, awesome. So that, and I've always wanted to go to Cali. And the thing is right now, as I have a couple job offers on the table, potentially, that tour, I think the first day would be a drive from Rochester to... Driving from Rochester to Texas, which is a 22-hour drive from Rochester to Dallas, would be the start. Oof. So it'd be leaving on March 18th or 19th. Realistically, if I don't have anything lined up by that time, I told Nate I'd let him know within the next few weeks. If I don't have anything solid lined up, and there's a little bit of pay involved, nothing mm-hmm. nothing uh, too exclusive or anything like that, but I enjoy going out with, with guys like that more so for... Good friends, mm-hmm. traveling, seeing the world, stuff like that. So, um, so touring, touring is an enjoyable experience for you. It is and isn't. There's there's parts of it I love, and there's of course parts of it that that kind of grind you down every day. Yeah. Um, back in November, and there's lots of things that I enjoy. Uh, it's always a challenge co-piloting all night, which is something that I like. Always volunteered to do, just staying up all night and just looking at the scenery, the whole nine yards, keeping whoever's driving awake that whole nine yards. Always fun and not fun at the same time, because once you hit, like, a wall, you just start getting moody. For me, at least, I start getting moody, then getting, like, that angsty, I haven't slept, like, Mm -hmm. miserable feeling. Another thing that I didn't, didn't enjoy, I actually, starting to, uh... A big thing about it was learning how to uh, fall asleep in a moving vehicle <laughs> was always a thing. There's bunks in the back of the van. Okay, awesome. And I was always the one to volunteer, if not only volunteer, but also whenever we got hotel rooms, motel rooms, anything like that, everybody would be like, oh, you know, we're all going to get this motel room. I'm like, and I'd be like, you know what, it's fine, guys. I'm going to just sleep in the van. Yeah. I would rather sleep in the van. I'm a, I'm a person that needs, you know... A little bit of personal space, very here and there. I understand um, that, for sure. And that's one of the things that really boils boils me down, personally, is the lack of personal space on tour. All of the just, the little things kind of start picking at you. When you're 
around the same people nonstop 24-7 for two to three weeks, and different people have different prerogatives when they yeah. they should have prerogatives like, hey, you know, we should be doing this, we, we need to really get on the road, we need to stop being late all the time, and when, you know, there's just all different mixes of stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I've only been on the road for like a week at a time, and mm-hmm. that... The uh, lack of alone time is the most has been the most difficult thing, but I mean, still, if an opportunity arises for me to be on the road longer than that, I I hope I get the opportunity to at some point in the future. It's fun. It really is. Like I said, it's fun and challenging at the same time. Another one of the big things is like I hate being away from my dog for that long. Mm-hmm. Like the last time was two and a half weeks and. That's just yeah. That's really one of the big things people are like. What, what do you, you know, not like about being on tour the most? And I'm just you know lack of personal space and like my dog's home. I miss my dog. Yeah. So you're you, you've done merch and you've also done some guitar teching. Is that, yeah. is that correct? So what what all are you doing as a guitar tech? Making sure everything's set up the right way. Getting uh, trying to recall what we did last summer. I'm just setting up pedals, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Nice. Getting everything on stage, loading, unloading, doing that, making sure all the merch is set up. All the bitch work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Going out to more so, just enjoy time with really good friends that I enjoy being out there with, and it's an experience. Yeah. It really is. It's one of my favorite things about it, realistically, is it is doing that, just doing the merch and guitar talking. It's a way to see a lot of things that would cost me an insane amount of money to do alone. Yeah. Okay. Realistically, like, we did 12 dates through, I want to say, eight or nine nine states, maybe more, two Canada dates in November, and then the one coming up is 20 or 21 days with... I think 12 different states. Okay. All on the other side of the coast. New yeah. Mexico, Nevada, Minnesota, Colorado, California. I'm trying to think of what else. Mm. All stuff like that. And it's just... That's, even if I do go this time around, like I said, it's it's up in the air right now. Mm-hmm. I can if if I'm in the right place as far as being moved and job stuff. And I know I have a bit of money saved up, which I'm immediately using to move and pay off a few months of the apartment and food mm-hmm. and really have myself taken care of. I don't have a exact start date for any job, mm. and I have a couple offers that are pending, and if I don't get either of them, of course, I'll sit at home, reapply for a dozen, two dozen jobs, sit around doing more work, IT stuff for certifications. Yeah. But okay. Now... With I Set My Friends on Fire, I'm I'm not a fan of that band. Which, By all means. Yeah, that's just that's just not my thing. I'm not, not hating on them. But I'm curious because that's they're a bigger band. Mm-hmm. And uh, by by certain standards. Yeah. Do they... How many ex- extra people other than the band members do they bring on tour? And what's, what's that like being on the road with a band at that level? Because like I said, I mean, I, I know... I know a lot of bands that do a lot of touring, but they're more on a DIY level. So I'm I'm just you know curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. A lot of the times, immediate crew is friends. Mm-hmm. It's friends that they know. Um, it's friends that can do the work that you know they trust to do work like that and be around the stuff yeah. and stuff like. So how many? How out many... in November, Johnny and Matt are from Florida, and. They flew into Rochester and brought Joel, who did photography and did very minute help doing other things, sat Mm -hmm. at the merch table when, you know, I needed some time to go do other things like eat or wanted a night. Like, we would switch up here and there, you know, hey, stay here for an hour while I go, you know, see friends that I know from the state that I've never gotten to meet or hang out with that I've, you know, known through social networking forever or through friends, stuff like that. Yeah. It was little stuff like that. Last time around, it was just band, which was Matt, Joe, Johnny, Nate, Josh. Is that it? Matt, Joe. Yeah. Matt, Joe, Johnny, Nate, Josh, 
me and Joel, so there were seven of us. Okay, so just two extra I sat people. Just, yeah, I said just did. They just did Europe. Mm-hmm. I had a bunch of things going on, and of course, rightfully, they wanted to, and it ended up taking someone with a bit more experience doing merch and keeping things together and mm-hmm. stuff like that. They did Matt's girlfriend and Ter- Therese for that. So they another two, two for crew for Europe. Usually it ends up being one or two. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I didn't know. I think the plans for this, I saw Nate last night. They leave for like four or five days just from Wednesday through the weekend mm-hmm. coming up. I don't even remember what the dates are in there. They're taking, uh, I think, one just for the five days. It really yeah. depends on how long. The amount of work they know can get done based on people, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. What what experience they have doing whatnot. Like I said, a lot of the time it's friends and people, you know, you, they trust being, you know, hey, do you want to come along? And, mm-hmm. you know, obviously we expect you to do work, but this is what we can potentially pay per night based on what we have in budget and then... X amount of money of tips up to a certain amount of money is yours. The rest goes yeah. to band. Stuff like that. All right, cool. I know I set just came back in November for the first time doing full band shows in for the first time in three to four years. So really, it's right now the whole thing with that is getting back on track to the level they want to be at. Mm-hmm. Cool. There's some big stuff in the works that I can't talk about for them that they've talked about so it'll be fun to it's always fun to watch and i'm sure you know that it's always fun to watch friends good friends grow and kind of do huge things yeah for me at least i it's a something that i really enjoy seeing some of my good friends i know i've got friends like the guys in uh in misgiver in meth mouth uh, a couple bands from out by the syracuse area bands that i'm watching get bigger are like Meth Mouth, Misgiver, the guys from Sleepers and Buffalo mm-hmm. that are starting to do slowly but surely do big things. Rob and the guys from Until We Are Ghosts. Yeah. They're a band that you can watch. Like, look at what they were doing three, four years ago to now. Now they're on In Vogue yeah, doing big on, things. Going on tour with Conveyor. Conveyor. That Conveyor record is That record awesome. rules. Yeah. And I- they just did the uh, Conveyor Ghost Key Tour. I think that was two tours ago. They're going back out with the boys from Conveyor. One of the coolest, going back to ISAT and talking about Until We Were Ghosts at the same time, one of the coolest shows that I've ever personally got to be a part of was at the end of one of the last days of the ISAT tour, which was ISAT, my friends on fire, Shiva, the boys from Shiva, I can't wait to see those guys again. And then Reckless Serenade was our part. At the Outpost in Kent, I don't know if you've ever been there, it's mm-hmm. dual stage, there's a, there's two stages, a smaller one and a bigger stage. Okay. We had a combination show with that, Until We Are Ghosts, Motives, Hotel Books, and Bad Luck on the big stage, switching, Shiva Reckless Serenade, I Set My Friends on Fire on the small stage. Oh, nice. And it was really cool, and one of the most intricate things I've ever seen is watching just the mixture of a crowd... You can only imagine the crowd at I Set My Friends on Fire headlining one side and then Hotel Books, which is, that's left field and right field. Yeah, what's, I actually, I've heard of Hotel Books, but I've never listened to them. Spoken so Word. Oh, okay. Cool. Like Spoken Word, that the big Spoken Word in vogue, kind of the big thing that in vogue is plugging these okay. days. None of the like sad, poetic, like, um... Almost listener, emo po- law dispute. Yeah, in in that vein. very a very listener. Think of listener, but not as acoustic and folky. Okay, but more towards the sad emo, like modern day emo. Okay, kind of th- thing. And nice. that's what Hotel Books is. Yeah. Um. So it was very, and Hotel Books is blown up too. It was very interesting to watch that happen on one side, and then. Kids who haven't seen I Set My Friends on Fire play in years and years, jumping off the stage, and (laughs) there were maybe 200, 250 people packed into an area only meant for one 125. So it was 
wild, to say the least. Cool. Well, one of the other things I wanted to talk, one of the main things I wanted to talk to you talk to you about is over the last what is it the last full year you uh, you've been you've been sober a full year is that yeah um, or a little over a year Febu- February eleventh so it's going on a year and two weeks a year last February which again it's funny like milestones I was looking back at. You know, my time hop, that whole thing, mm-hmm. time hop, what were you doing last year on Facebook or whatever, mm-hmm. and a little more than a, a year ago, it was a year at the end of January, I had moved into the house that I'm now moving out of. Mm-hmm. So I, February 11th was my one year of, you know, sobriety, no drinking, no drugs, anything like that, a little over a year ago. I moved into the house that I'm fully moving out of tomorrow. Okay. So it's it's cool to see how far I've come and what I've done in just a year of kind of doing the main part of my growing up and getting my life together. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not straight edge, but I, I think it's a really awesome, positive thing, and it's cool to see friends take steps to make their life better. So, you know, if you don't mind talking a little bit about why you made the decision to yeah. quit drinking and and what brought that all about. I'll actually touch on a very common question I get asked a lot is a lot of people ask that question, you know, if you go into like an NANA room, AANA room, stuff like that, see people who kind of know the almost trivial, you know, sober, AA, whatever, stuff like that is like, oh, you know, what was your rock bottom is a question I get kind of here and there. That's one of the questions I get. And the real answer to that is there wasn't – there was a lot of them mm-hmm. over an eight-year time span because I was very heavily drinking almost every day, every night for – from 21 to to 23 – was a main stint of it when I could buy it, but I had other people to buy me things like alcohol mm-hmm. and would go out and buy drugs and stuff like that before that from maybe 17, 18. And more of those nights than not, I was drinking or doing some sort of form of drugs or stuff like that. And the the answer to that question is that there wasn't any particular rock bottom. Mm-hmm. I kind of lived it for eight years, just <laughs> consistently. <laughs> and it's it's funny that track of mind that went on when I decided to kind of stop all the all that shit is um I woke up one day and at the time it wasn't even a relationship that lasted long. I dated a girl for maybe a week, week and a half, and she had a kid. Mm. And I woke up one day, and I was like, you know, I really kind of like this girl. I'd like to meet her kid eventually, but I don't want to do it as this person. Mm. And I'd been hanging out with and working with another friend of ours, Nate mm-hmm. uh, Davenport. What's who, up, Nate? <laughs> <laughs> who lives a, uh, a similar lifestyle. And... It's funny because I try to get everything straight on a timeline, and I've been trying to while writing a little bit of a memoir-esque kind of thing that's about 13 pages long now. And my mind always goes here and then there, and I'm like, oh, I forgot about this part. So it jumps around when I try to explain it to people, but I've been really thinking about cutting all of it out of my life and at least taking a break because I was sick of waking up feeling like garbage. I had a really bad gut rot a lot of the time and couldn't eat for, for days on end a lot of the time because my stomach was that shot and I would vomit like bile or blood, stuff mm-hmm. like that a lot of the time. And it was getting to points where I would mix like Alka-Seltzer. I'd drop like an Alka-Seltzer in beer. Because my stomach was that shot, and but I wanted to drink more. So I was seeing a girl. One of the... Uh, I'm sorry, my mind keeps jumping around about things like this. It's hard to almost keep straight what happened in what time period yeah. because it's been a long road about it. But 
I was seeing a girl that I didn't really end up seeing for very long, but I initially quit because I was like, you know, I don't want to be the same type of person my dad was. My dad was a heavy alcoholic and still is, was for 35, 36 years, Mm. me growing up with that. I was like, you know, it'd be really cool if I just kind of started taking care of myself. And I didn't just quit with the intention of quitting forever. And I didn't quit with the attention of, you know, I'm going to be straight edge. I'm done with this. I didn't mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't wake up one morning and decide, like, this is over. I woke up and I was like, you know, I really need to start taking better care of myself. Because I looked in the mirror and I didn't like what I saw. I was bloated. There was a different look in my eyes than I wanted to see. And people would ask me at that point, some of my good friends, some of my friends that I was constantly heavily drinking with and spending full weekends just partying with and nonstop partying, um, there would be points we'd be drinking till 4 a.m. and go to Wegmans at like 1.45 and buy like one more 30 rack because we couldn't run out. (laughs) If we ran out, it was a travesty. Yeah. But we'd go to Wegmans at like 1.45 a.m., already just hammered, buy another 30 rack, drank five of them each, wake up in the morning, and we'd be like, the minute we woke up at 8, 9 a.m., whatever time it was, be like, ugh, and we'd go right back into drinking again, even if it was 6 or 7 a.m., mm. go right back into it and just continue on from there all day, kind of just doing whatever goofy crap we could and just going through that. Mm-hmm. So those friends all asked me at the time. They were like, you know, oh, I, I was like, you know, they'd be, you know, hey, come out, come party. And I'd be like, no, I'm taking a break from things. They'd be like, for good or what? And I'd be like, I don't know. I, I initially would tell people that I didn't plan on permanently quitting drinking. Yeah. It just ended up that way. After time passed and I realized how much better I was doing with life, how much money, there were all the positives and so few negatives of kind of not partying and not taking care of myself. Obviously, there's more positives to taking care of yourself as opposed to negatives. After realizing how much growing up I did, not being ridiculous, and taking a hard look at myself and what was going on in that whole nine yards, I realized, like, for the better, I was like, this is is the life I want to live now. It's just... Not going back to all that. Mm-hmm. So, you, so, how recently did you, I don't know, whatever it means to officially claim edge or whatever. The way I treated my sobriety is I took it with milestones. Mm-hmm. I think with life in general, I've started to realize that with life in general, you uh, have to consistently make sure you're doing more. Mm-hmm. I feel like, and that's kind of what I've done the whole time that I've been sober, is making sure that I'm not at any point in time staying stuck in one place and keeping my feet in one place for too long because I've watched a lot of people, a lot of friends, just become rooted. Mm -hmm. They get comfortable with something like they get a job that they're making a comfortable amount of money with, but they have bigger goals. But then they kind of just get stuck in that job because they're like, well, I'm not doing horribly, but I'm not where I want to be. And they they talk about the fact that, you know, I'm going to do more, I'm going to do more, I'm going to go back to school, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But they don't do much more besides talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I've watched friends do that for years and just not go someplace with it. So I've really tried to take steps, make milestones, not root, not plant my feet too hard, which is why I'm moving. Mm -hmm. It's a big reason of why I'm moving. It's a big reason of why I left the job I was just at as well. At three months into my sobriety, I hadn't traveled up until this past year, 2015. I hadn't traveled in almost 11 to 12 years out of New York State, Wow. out of the area that we're in, the Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse, maybe a little bit farther than that. When I stopped drinking, stopped that whole nine yards, I started realizing that... I had money in my wallet and in my bank account. I was like, wow, what do I do now? So I um, took a trip to Texas for my, uh, and visited a couple friends. Cool. 
um, for three months into my sobriety. So an official three months, I was in Texas. For my birthday, it was May 10th. I was in Texas from, I think, the 8th through, like, the 13th or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And that was my big milestone there is, like, all right, I've seen more. I've done more. I've left the, the state and gone farther than I've ever gone for three months. Then I came home and got my dog. That was another th part of my three months. At six months was when I quit smoking cigarettes. Okay. And I think once I was really done smoking cigarettes, that was it. Once I knew that it was just like, no more, I'm okay. done smoking, I've been without cigarettes or any form of nicotine, anything like that, for longer than I ever have. Once I hit that point, I was like, what can, what can really ground me more? Mm -hmm. And the whole, the whole claim to straight edge thing is, when people ask about it is, you know, oh, you're straight edge. I try to explain the fact that I don't do it to be uh, an arrogant asshole about the fact that I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't do anything like that. It wasn't ever one of those things where it was, and it still isn't any one of those things where it's a statement of being better than anybody for me. Mm -hmm. um, it was just one more thing to keep me grounded into not picking anything up again. Yeah, cool. It's one more thing where, you know, now that I'm getting older, I kind of... I've started to also realize that I'm, like, sticking true to my word more and more and gaining more of a moral conscience as I move along, as I've started taking better care of myself, as I did all this growing up in the past year. And it was just one of more of those things where, like, it locked down my own moral conscience. Mm -hmm. People see me wear, like, a hat with an X on it or something like that. Or they stumble upon my Facebook page and they'll, they smoke weed or have the occasional drink or go out to the bar and stuff all the time. And they're friends. Or I'll start talking to a girl and they'll be like, oh, you know, oh, your edge? Is it going to be a problem that I, you know, smoke weed or smoke cigarettes or have, you know, or drink or anything like that? And the way that I like to explain it to people is that... The way I look at it is as long as you're not immediately endangering your own life or the lives of the other of other people around you, it's not my place to step in and tell you what to do as far as, you know, smoking or drinking or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to step in and be rude about anything. It's not my place. It's not my my place to tell you what to do with your life. I'm living my own you live your own life. Yeah, and it's not like people don't already know that smoking and drinking is not the best thing for them. <laughs> exactly, and there's no place for me to be preachy about. And once I explain that to people, they kind of almost loosen their grip on the stereotype they have placed in their head about straight edge. And mm -hmm. I'm making finger quotes for people who can't see that. <laughs> but I feel that Anybody that I've talked to after I explain that, they kind of loosen their, like I said, they loosen their grip on the stereotype that they have embedded in their mind on how someone who claims edge is going to act mm -hmm. towards anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still, I still go out to the bar. I'll play darts. I'll eat food. Your normal, you know, Saturday, Sunday night when it's not busy... You can find me at Marshall Street, nine ten o'clock, hanging out with friends who are drinking, mm -hmm. having, I'll drink like a cranberry juice with tonic water in it, and I'll shoot darts, and I'll get food. It's not something, I'm not above other people, because I'm living my own lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right. Well, I think it would be mis a mistake if we didn't talk about Kanye on this episode. <laughs> So, what do you think of this new record? It's amazing. It's, you know what? I'll agree with people in this sense. Did you listen to it fully on my, what is it? Uh, title. Title. Yeah, this guy 
let me use his title account so I could hear it. Did you it, listen to the whole thing? I have. I've there listened to the are, whole album. I won't lie, that there are a lot of really arrogant and ridiculous, not only like 50 second tracks, like the I Love Kanye track <laughs> on it was really obnoxious, but after you listen to it, back to what we talked about where Kanye, the best way to explain Kanye West is that he's the best heel on the face of the planet that the WWE never had. When you listen to a couple of these tracks, it almost solidifies that idea. Yeah, and it, that I love Kanye track. As soon as I listened to it all the whole way through, and like listened to the whole track, and that end line that he says in that track is what is it? I love you the way Kanye loves Kanye, and then yeah. he laughs on the track. It's very as as self-aware. You, He's aware of the fact that he does it, and someone I was talking to someone last night about him, and they were like, I hate Kanye West. He's a prick. He's arrogant. There's no way I could ever like him. And the way I explained it was comparing it to another couple musicians out there. He sells himself the same way ICP sells themselves on a higher, more global level, where more people are aware of his presence in that sense than they are, you know, you walk into, I'm going to use a hypothetical example, you walk into like an Abercrombie and Fitch and you ask someone who ICP is, they might not know. You ask them who Kanye West is, they'll know. Mm -hmm. It's the same type of any publicity is publicity tactic. And if I can be the best villain out there, I'm still getting attention and people are still buying my stuff tactic that other musicians have used in the past. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Even celebrities have used that in the past. Look at people like, off the top of my head, Paris Hilton. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that whole Simple Life thing? And then you'd watch her talk on a late night talk show with like, Jay Leno, and you're like, is this the same person? Because at the end of the day, there's two sides of every person. There's the side that the public needs to see, which was for, like, say, Paris Hilton, The Simple Life, where she's acting like a ditzy blonde. But she's part of a family that's one of the most business-savvy families on the face of the planet. And you watch one of these people talk seriously on a late-night talk show, and you're like... Wait, what? They're not an idiot? Yeah, I think there's a lot of celebrities that their persona that we know them as is not who they really are. Which it it should go without saying, but people still but people are so wrapped up in, in it that they get pissed off and, and don't understand that they're just playing characters. That and the fact that um, a big trend over the past few years with people is... As far as social media goes, you see an article and you don't get past reading the header of the article and you don't dive in to look up more more information on it. You go based solely off of what you see in the article. Per se, um, everybody's making all these memes about Kanye West, about how he's quote-unquote $53 million in debt. But if you read farther into these articles, I was explaining this to someone last night. He's not, per se, $53 million in debt. And I used finger quotes again for people who can't (laughs) see this. What happened is he just invested, I don't know if you read this, he invested Mm -hmm. $53 million into his clothing lines. So his spring line, his summer line, and his fall line for the upcoming 2016 season. Yeah. He invested $53 million into that which is nine months' worth of a clothing line, all of the clothing for it, the designs, the whole nine yards, and then into his music. His clothing lines have a turnaround of 25 to $35 million per season from what I was reading. <laughs> I was looking up all the facts. So he's not $53 million in debt. He just invested $53 million for a turnaround of up to... An estimated hundred and five million to double that fifty three million. Yeah. He's not in debt. I would wording it 
more correctly, per se, making a better wording of it. He's $53 million kind of in the hole. He has $53 million less than he did before he did this right now. Yeah, and I mean, he, he knows that he's going to He knows what it. he's doing. Yeah, I mean... If you don't think people like this, who are that high on the spotlight, do things to... Kanye West just put out his new album what, last week? About a week and a half ago? Yeah. And how many things have you heard about him in the weeks coming up to this release? In the mo- couple months coming out to this release? And the cu- past coming weeks coming up to this release? As far as things go. I was trying to make this point to someone as well. I know I saw a local clothing company release like a, a Kanye shirt or something like mm-hmm. that. And I was... You know, having a very civil argument about it where I was just like, you know, for what it's worth, hating someone like this, like Kanye West, a public figure, is as... Gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like like we were just going back to the WWE Mm -hmm. comparison. Hating Kanye West with a serious passion is like hating The Undertaker because he beat up John Cena or something. Yeah. And taking it seriously. It baffles me that people are taking it that seriously when it's a ruse. Yeah. <laughs> That's, he's, he's, if, he's if you don't brilliant think, as far as as far as his it's just it's all viral marketing and if you really listen to any of his albums there's enough content on there that is very self-aware that I think it gives away the fact that he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He's making people hate him intentionally because this is what I explained to that you know that person that's locally doing the Kanye West shirts. I was like, you know, for what it's worth, if if I go out to a show and I see someone wearing a shirt that's hating on a you know. A big celebrity. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna think to myself. I wonder what that person's recently doing to make people mad. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna look them up on Google. If if someone random who doesn't know Kanye West just dropped a new album sees someone wearing a you know a I hate Kanye West shirt, they're gonna be like, I wonder what Kanye's doing lately to make people mad. They're gonna go on Google. They're gonna look him up. They're going to see, uh, based off all these articles about Kanye West, they're also going to see uh, that he just dropped a new album. Mm-hmm. Then what are they going to do? They're going to be interested in hearing a few things off that new album, or they're going to click on these articles or go to Kanye West's webpage mm-hmm. and just give him more publicity, more clicks, the whole nine yards. By wearing an I Hate Kanye West shirt, you're giving him free viral marketing <laughs> And it's almost like clickbait. That's exactly what it is. It's literally the tactic that he's using to sell his stuff. And for what it's worth, it's working. Yeah. That that album's great. Now, my main criticism of the album is that Ultra Light Beam is too good to be the opening track because... Did you hear the separate... There's two Ultra Light Beam tracks. One... If you go on YouTube, there's a track for Ultra Light Beam that wasn't even on the album. Yeah, I did hear that. Did you hear that one? Yeah. It was, it was like Chance the Rapper and someone else. I, I feel, the Dream, Chance, and someone else mixed on an Ultra Light Beam track that I don't even think Kanye was on at all, but wasn't featured on the album either. Mm-hmm. And then there's the opening track, Ultra Light Beam, which is the catchiest track that I've heard in a long time. That, that's what I'm saying. I wish... It's almost like I hear it, and I, I just want to listen to that track over and over again. I did Without that. moving on. Yeah. I did that. that. That was what I did. When that, when Ultra that Light choir Beam. kicks in, man, that is so freaking powerful. It's so good. That track and Wavy. Mm-hmm. When I hear every time I hear Wavy, I just want to listen to it over again. And he was gonna name his album, he was gonna have Wavy be the title track. And I forget what the controversy was. I think a different artist also released. I don't remember who it was. I think someone, he just changed his mind. Someone gave him controversy about the title Wavy, but that track, the thing that 
really made me laugh very hard was the fact that some of the arrogant lines that are self-aware are so out there and ridiculous. Yeah. The one about Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, that Because he makes, a, he makes a reference saying to the fact that, like, allegedly when he uh, interrupted her Grammy speech, or, was it a Grammy? Yeah, it was Grammy. When he interrupted her Grammy speech, that's what made her famous. Which is and, absolutely ridiculous. Which is, of course, ridiculous. <laughs> and Kanye West would be obnoxious to not... To, to genuinely think that that was what happened would be a ridiculous. It's an artist winning a Grammy. Obviously, they're already getting the recognition yeah. they need and deserve. But for him to say something as arrogant as, like, I made her famous, he knows, again, he knows what he's doing. And I tried to explain to someone recently, and I tried to explain to people that by hating Kanye West, you can get mad all you want, but you're literally... You're you're being trolled. You're yeah. buying into exactly what he wants out of it. And someone tried to argue that, like, no, metalheads really hate Kanye West. And I'm like, no, you don't get that you're buying into what he wants you to do. As to put it in wrestling terms, you're getting worked, bro. You're, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> There's people like... God, I'm trying to think of who would... The most memorable heel of recent times would be probably I mean, the Miz. Oh, I'm I'm thinking about back even further and to a higher level of greatness. I'm thinking about Ric Flair back in the day. <laughs> you know, talking about the alligator shoes and these shoes cost more than your house. And- yeah, people are getting worked and worked up over Kanye West when it's one of the most ingenious tactics, and everybody is falling for it. It's a, yeah. it's almost something that's hard to understand if you don't watch wrestling, though. Yeah, I, I think it changes the way you view his art when you look at it through that lens. Yeah. But at the same time, I would... He's using that tactic, but at the same time, if you listen to his more serious tracks, he's still a very brilliant musician. Yeah, and he's he's not just self-aware, he's socially aware and... There's a lot of interesting social commentary on his records. Also, tying it to wrestling, did you hear the two wrestling references on the album? What ones? He says, I'm like a mix of Steve Jobs and Steve Austin. Yes, and I, I think, do remember that one. I think there's another line on the album where he says, I'm macho like Randy. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Exactly. The line that makes me laugh every time is I forget what song it's a break in. But he, when he's like, hold up, hold up, hold up, I'm the ghetto Oprah, you get a jet, you get a jet. And he's like, you get a big booty bitch. I just start losing it laughing every time I hear that line. And there's another one. It's not him, it's a line that a different rapper uses. Is There's just a lot of lines on that album that are so obnoxious that it almost makes me think back to like, Macho Man or Hogan's, like, joke rap CDs. <laughs> I forget what the line is, but one's like, I want to put a GoPro on my dick or whatever. I, I do you do remember, remember that, that line? One. Me and my friend Alicia, who I keep making listen to it, she, every time we're driving, like, I won't even be talk like, listening, seriously listening, I'll be doing something on my phone, and I'll just hear her laughing, and she's like, that stupid line again. And I'm like, what line? The GoPro line? And she's like, yeah. And she just starts losing it laughing. <laughs> my favorite Kanye line is actually on my my uh, my beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. That, lo- that CD is his... What's the word I'm looking for? What's the phrase I'm looking for? His masterpiece. His... Um, it, it is. His... There's, there's a French word line for it. There's a French phrase that I'm trying to think of. You know um, what I'm talking about? Like, his... His masterpiece, his... I don't, I don't know the term you're looking for. Uh, I'm going to think about it as soon as we're done with this. But I, love, I love the line, too many Urkels on your team. That's, That's why, why you win, win slow. slow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I mean, we're over an hour, so we might as well uh, wrap it up. Any, any final words that you want to say to anybody? Anything <laughs> you want to promote? There's an event coming up that my buddy Tyler Montgomery is putting on that has... If you're into hardcore, post-hardcore, want to see any of the bigger bands in that genre that are coming up 
all of pretty much every up and coming band that I can think of from the a- area is on it. It's on May 28th in Cleveland, New York, mm. which is, I think, a part of Syracuse. I'm not sure where that is. Every up and coming band that's really going to blow up, in my opinion, in the next six months to a year is on it. I don't know if you caught that. Until We Are mm-hmm. Ghosts, Bungler, Misgiver, Sleepers, The Alaskan, Through Her Eyes, Delinquents, lots of friends, lots of big bands that are doing big things from Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, even as far as I think Albany. I think, I don't remember where The Alaskan's from. That's coming up. Right. And if you want to go check that out, that's a big thing coming up. Like we were just talking about Conveyor and Until We Are Ghosts is coming up. That tour is hitting Buffalo. Before Ironworks? Is that where that's I, Yeah, at? Ironworks. Okay. There's that. I'm trying to think of... I don't think there's any I Set My Friends on Fire's dates coming up around the area. The closest thing I think is at the end of April, The Loft in Ohio. What else is coming up that you can think of? Uh, March 4th. I don't know when you're releasing that. March 4th is... A, fa- a really good chance to check out a lot of good local ca- talent, even if you're not into asking Alexandria. There's two sides on that. Mm. That buying a ticket to the show gets you access to both sides. Nice. One side is asking Alexandria while she sleeps. While she sleeps is a fantastic UK band. And a couple locals on the other side, aphasia, reformer, apparatus, story inspired from Buffalo, Voices of Valor, which is Brock, who uh, was doing all the work on the pillar. Okay. Voices of, Voice of Valor's, I think his new project? Okay. Plagues of Endeavor, that's March 4th at Water Street. That's going to be big. It's a good chance to check out, even if you're not into that sort of music. A lot of just local talent. I know me personally, and I don't. You do the same thing as I do. We just both like going and checking out a lot of stuff. I, I if try I have to. An, if, if I have an off night and I have absolutely nothing going on, no one wants to do anything, I'll go and drop the 6 to 25 bucks just to go to a show mm-hmm. and just to go out and see what's going on locally. The March 18th show. Did you see that one? Which one is that? On Earth Ringworm, Fit oh, for an yeah. Autopsy. That's going to be good. Sage is doing the March 4th show. Um, Randy over at Montage is doing the March 18th show. (laughs) Drews' album release at Bug That's one. That's a big Uh, one. March 5th, that lineup is... Who's on? There's Drews. Throat Culture. Yeah. Taking Meds. The Slums. Coming Down, who are awesome. The Jared... If you want to go see the Jared Johnson experience, go out to the Bug Jar on March 5th. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's going to be a good show. He does Jared's and Drews and Throat Culture, right? No, he's not in either of those bands. He I put it, he, he released the Drews. Oh, okay. Um, on his label well, I take that back. He's playing in Backbiter. So he that's, is that's he's playing is. that show. He is. He's on that show still. Did he put together that show or did him and Tim maybe? I I, I don't know. Him you know. and the guys from Drews and Tim probably. Yeah. Jared's somebody that is going to be on the show at some point soon. We're going to dig into all his old bands. What's up, Jared? Hey, Jared. <laughs> but, I don't have a lot of events coming up on my my thing. I know there's a lot of good stuff coming out. Tim's always got a lot of good stuff. Sage always has a lot of good stuff. And Randy's stuff, always got a lot stuff of... Stuff coming here, to More indie stuff. All That Remains but, is coming up. Okay. Texas Hippie Coalition's coming up at Montage. Everybody who's booking around Rochester is booking great stuff. Cool. Now, uh, if people want to find you on the internet, where can they do that? They can Snapchat. My Snapchat chat is, uh, I think it's still Kingdom of Hell, all one word. My Instagram is xgrimcreeperx, <laughs> which I'm full of puns. I like dad jokes and making puns. Facebook, Paul James Bourgeois. I'll probably do some sort of blog, something like that, sometime soon. Cool. Like I said, I'm working on a memoirs thing for my past year. See, the thing is, every time I try to work on it, I think of more that I want to add to it, and like we, I was just doing while trying to talk about my sobriety, I jump around and then I almost get, not writer's block, I just got to sit down and just 
write everything and then sort it the way it needs to be sorted, I guess. Yeah, that seems like a huge undertaking to I mean, you want to, it's your own story so you can tell it, but at the same time organizing it. Did and, you ever read or hear of the book Dharma Punks? Cuz at the heard same of it, but time I've never read it. It's kind of about I believe if I remember correctly is about the uh, um journey of uh, I forget what his name is, the writers journey through punk music and addiction and then mm-hmm. finding Buddhism and everything like that. And I keep doing this thing where I want to just write about my my addiction and my sobriety and everything like that. But then I almost want to incorporate, like, I've got almost 11, 12 years into the music scene. Yeah. And I almost want to do a similar thing to that, but I think about... Where do I start? So then I just sit down at my MacBook and end up writing, you know, five more pages of just jumbled random experiences. And it's going to be a challenge over the next few years of when I sit down because I'm such a procrastinator about writing that stuff and organizing of really how to organize writing a book like that. Mm-hmm. Well, if you – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this into self-promotion. <laughs> if if you need some uh some inspiration, listen to the episode that came out well, while we're recording this, the episode that I put out this morning with CJ Campbell. Okay. He's a friend of mine from Illinois. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying this for anybody else who may be listening to the episode that you're on that didn't listen to last week's as well. Yeah. Uh he actually wrote a, a memoir called The Zen of Beard Trimming. And <laughs> sto- I think I saw you talk about interviewing him. Yeah, I just I just posted the episode this morning or a week ago if you're listening in the future. And he talks a little bit about his writing process and what he's doing with his new podcast and also we talk a lot about Daniel Bryan because uh, <laughs> that was a big influence on him Who so if, retired recently. Yeah. So which that's another thing we didn't talk talk much about today, but last week there's a lot of wrestling talk. So I don't I don't want this to turn into a wrestling podcast, which it could <laughs> easily do, given how given into the fact wrestling that we both I am. Like WWE, I haven't been as interested in it lately. It's been it's not been. It hasn't lately. been good because everybody's injured and then retiring, and a lot of people are tapping out. And then there's a lot of random things going on right now, but a lot of people are calling it quits. As far as from what I was seeing and what it looks like is that it looks like there might be a lot of trouble brewing in the WWE and things going on, and that... Anyways, we won't turn it into a wrestling podcast. Yeah, there's there's uh, lots of other wrestling podcasts doing a great job yeah. of bringing the world great wrestling audio content, so... <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's... We'll, we'll, we'll cut it off now, because we'll just keep finding more shit to talk about, and this will go <laughs> on all day. All right. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit of your story. Yeah. And I'll, you know, hopefully people will enjoy it. And if anybody ever wants to talk to me about the addiction stuff as well, they can always reach out to me. Awesome. I'm a very – I know you've probably seen it on Facebook. I'm very adamant about people reaching out for the help they need if they're in a dark place, albeit mental health disorder, whether it be any sort of drug alcohol-related issues – if anybody just needs someone to talk to, it's a big thing. It needs to be something that's promoted more is that there's people out there that you can talk to at any time of day or night, whether it be, you know, any sort of hotline, whatever it may be. There's there's help out there, and that really a big part of life is just to keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. So cool. that's definitely something that needs to be touched on. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit stop. Okay. Right now. Thanks for listening, guys. In this episode, you heard Burning Bridges is so 1999 by One Dead, Three Wounded. Now, as always, I want to plug Podcast of Pennsylvania for letting me be a part of this awesome network. Check out their feed on iTunes or any other uh, podcast listening app. They're doing some really cool things over there other than this show, so make sure you check them out. Now, I will be back later this week. I've got a short episode with Mike Jacobs from the band On the Cinder. 
We had a really good time hanging out the other day, and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. So, I will talk to you later this week.